There are, uh, this is not my message, but there are four flows of ministry that Paul itemized that he was used to. 1 Corinthians 14, 6 says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Those were those are four completely different flows of anointing and ministry. It's not enough to find out what God wants you to say. It's, it's not just what he wants you to say. It's how he wants you to say it. What flow of the anointing you need to be in to do that. An old prophet taught me as a young man that, for instance, working the altar, that if, if you're praying for a sick person, somebody comes up and wants the Holy Ghost, you don't go from one to the other. Or if you're praying for people to receive the Holy Ghost and somebody comes up and wants to be prayed for because they're sick, you don't, you don't force the switch and the flow. You follow the flow. You don't tell God how to flow. He knows what the needs are. Find the flow and get in it. Why is that important? Because if you switch the flow, you're not going to have the results you're looking for. And then your confidence is going to be undermined. And then you're going to resort back to using your intellect and humanity to keep from being embarrassed. This is not my lesson, so I won't. I just, I don't know who, why, whatever. I just felt to share that. Okay. Uh, I want to just read a little, little bit here before I comment. This is going to be a little different. Um, this is going to be not a lot of teaching and a lot of ministry. Yesterday we ministered in a general sense and uh, today it's going to be much more specific nobody's going to call you out nobody's going to tell anybody the world what it is that your situation is but the Lord wants you to go home whole Amen. Psalms 109 and verse 21 uh, I'm going to read 21 or 22. But do thou for me, O God, the Lord, for thy name's sake, because thy mercy is good, deliver thou me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. Psalms 147 and 3 says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. That's not natural bandages. And the prophecy of the coming Messiah, starting in Isaiah 42 and 1, is very specific. So, Again, I'm just, re I'm just trying to give you some foundation here, some biblical foundation, okay? Here is the prophecy of the coming Messiah's ministry. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break. And the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment and the truth. Now that's quoted in 
the Gospels, and just, I, I can't help myself here. Just, you got to get this picture. A reed grew by the waters, and they were hollow, and you, they, they were so plentiful, and you cut one down, you cut a few holes, and you make yourself a flute. And, and it, it's very fragile, but a skilled player, and David was one of those, could, could make beautiful music from that very common, easily damaged reed that grew in such abundance. And it was, they grew in such abundance, and the flutes were so easily made that if the flute got damaged, you just tossed it away. Went out and cut you a new one and made it. But this coming Messiah, oh, a bruised reed he will not break. He's not just going to take that bruised reed and say, oh, well, it's damaged goods. Let's go find another one. You feel this? You feel that? Okay. And a smoking flax he will not quench. Flax was the most common stuff they had, and they would take it and twist it, and, and it became the wick, and, and, the, and the, the poor people especially, their lamps were just bowls, and they'd put oil in it, and, uh, and they'd stick that wick over the side of the bowl, and it would soak up the oil, and, and, and then they would light the wick, and that's how they'd get lamp and uh, light in their, their uh, houses at night. And the wicks were so inexpensive, even for poor people, that when the oil ran out and, and the flame, therefore, went out of the wick, end of the wick, the wick would smoke. And even the poor people would just toss the wick away and pour new, more oil in the bowl and put a new piece of flax in there and start all over. But not my Jesus. If for whatever reason you've allowed your oil to run out and instead of light coming from your life, it's just smoke. <coughs> He's not going to cast you aside. He's going to refill your bowl and repair you as a wicked, relight you. My God. Mm. Verse 4, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set forth judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant to the people, for a light to the Gentiles. That's, I'm one of them. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And then, open that please, thank you. And then, <laughs> oh Lord, I can't tell you how much I love this chapter. Isaiah 61. <sighs> this is written in the first person singular, the least significant portions of it are. And it is prophecy of the Lord speaking about himself and his ministry. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all, all. Do you, do you believe God says what he means and means what he says? I, 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 I'm just a simple person. Regardless of what you, whether you believe that statement's true or not, 
I'm a simple person. The greatest faith is not, doesn't come from sophisticates. The greatest faith is childlike faith. I have seven grandchildren, two sons and seven grandchildren. And let me tell you something about children. You have to teach a child not to trust. Because that child is born with great faith. If you said it, mom, dad, you're going to do it. And they are shocked and in despair if you don't do what you said because your mom, your dad, great faith is simply taking God at his word without question and without doubt and without having to have it all figured out. I just have simple faith to comfort all, not some, not most, all who mourn. So anybody that's mourning who is not comforted is a prime target. And I've got, I've got authority and a promise that I can minister to that person and they're going to receive comfort. And how does he give that comfort? To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called, and, and listen, listen to what a person becomes after they receive the ministry of verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. Listen. That they might be called the trees of righteousness. Immovable. Steadfast. Consistent. But that's not all. Trees of righteousness. The planning of the Lord that he might be glorified. And they shall, they, who, who's the they? The people that have received this ministry. And they shall build the old wastes. They shall rise up, the, up, raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the aliens shall be your, be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Who? The people who receive the ministry of verses 1, 2, and 3. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame you shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them. They that are the, are the seed which the Lord, that, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. For he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, the robe of his innocence. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself for her, with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before the nations. How does this 
How does this take place? It takes place because you accept the call, not just to the first ministry, but to the second ministry. Here's what I'm talking about. Luke 17, beginning with verse 12, a story you've all read. Most of you probably preached about it. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, it says as they went, they were cleansed. But the next verse says that's a synonym to healed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan, and Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? Or ten healed. But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God save the stranger. And he said unto them, arise, unto him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee. Hath made thee. In the Bible, leprosy is a type of sin. So that ten lepers being cleansed or healed is a type of salvation from sin. What happened in the second ministry? What happened to the one that came back? What was that all about? What did he get that the nine didn't get? They all ten, metaphorically, got saved. They all ten, metaphorically, they all ten got saved. But what did the one get that came back? And notice, he didn't know why he came back except to glorify God. He didn't come back. He didn't come back asking for something. He came back to give thanks over his salvation. But praise, true praise, worship, and thanksgiving opens you up to receive the next dimension of ministry. And what did he receive? Without knowing what he was, oh, without knowing what he was looking for, he received wholeness. Wholeness. Luke four, verse sixteen. And he came to Pat to Nazareth. He, he was filled with the spirit, spirit, and the Spirit led him into the wilderness. He fasted 40 days. He was after, after 40 days of fasting, he was, he was tempted of the devil, or the devil put him to the test. After he defeated those tests, he then was led by the Spirit out of the wilderness, which is the desert. Don't despise your desert places. Don't despise your desert places. Because he went into the desert filled with the Spirit, but he came out of the desert with the power on him. He was in the power. The preposition he came out in the power of the Spirit is the preposition of place. 
he was in the power. The power was on him. He, came, he went in full of the Holy Ghost. But a not, most Christians, most apostolics, don't spend enough time understanding and cooperating with the desert so they can be more than just filled with the Spirit, but they can have the power. Oh, but we have power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon us after that. How do we get from being full of the Spirit to having the power? It takes some desert places. It takes some desert places. And if you can't keep a right spirit and attitude and not accuse God in your desert places and understand the same one who filled you led you there for a purpose. God never moves you up a level of ministry on top of the mountain. If he, when he gets ready to promote you and move you into a greater dimension of, leader, uh, of ministry, he always does it in a desert. Always. If you're on the mountain, you're not moving up any place. And if that's where you think you've got to live all the time, you're not moving any. You got, that's as far as you're going to go if you're on the mountaintop. That's it. Bottom line. But if you're in the valley, if you're down, if you're in the, if you're in the desert, there, I, my loving father, my loving father never leads me into the desert to punish me. He leads me into the desert to move me into a new dimension in him. That's why. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, I think it's verse 22, sister, I'm not even sure, somewhere along there. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with, King James says, with the affections and lust thereof. And you go, huh? Isn't an affection kind of like a lust? If I have an affection for something, isn't that the same thing as lusting after it? Sorry, the word translated af affection there in almost every location in the King James is suffering. Anybody here have an affection for sufferings? There you go with King James again. I don't mean the Bible, I mean the guy. And his minions at the Anglican church who translated. Well, what does that mean? They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust thereof. I got some idea what it means. My flesh is crucified with the lusts. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. By, the, by the, the operation of the grace of God in my life that empowers me to do what I cannot do myself, I am able to say no to the lust of my flesh. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Not the lusts of the body. He didn't say anything about mortifying the lust. You can't get that spiritual. And if you preach to people get that spiritual, just open the back door and run them out. Because you're setting up a, a standard that's above Scripture that's only going to produce frustration because it's a lie. You can't get spiritual enough to not have any problems with your flesh. How do you deal with it? By not dealing with it fleshly, you deal with it spiritually. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So that, that part's simple, but how do I get crucified to my sufferings? By quit resisting and resenting the path God leads you on. All he showed was a picture of a uniform. He didn't show two years after that date. When I went from a cockpit to digging ditches to support a home missions ministry. I went from flying Navy airplanes to refusing to take any job that they wanted a three, five-year commitment on. 
Everybody would have happy to hire me with my degree, but they wanted three to five year commitment because they were going to have to train me to do their job. Love to have me. Would have been thrilled to brag about having a Naval Academy graduate working for them. But I didn't go there for that. So UPS wouldn't hire me. They wouldn't hire me because you're overqualified. You're not going to stay. We're going to waste our time with you. The only people to hire me was a construction crew. And I didn't have any experience, so I operated a hickory handle backhoe in a ditch, putting in storm drain and water line and sewer line. That's a long way down, figuratively and otherwise, from a cockpit to a ditch. But whatever was necessary to fulfill the call, that wasn't unreasonable of God to ask that. What did the brother say last night? In Santa Barbara? Sleeping in alleys? Where's God? Right there in that alley. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what. Some of the most Wonderful days of my life, looking back on it. Whereas that first little out-of-season summer cottage we could rent because I had $300 to my name when I drove into the city with no support, nobody, nobody there waiting on us, nothing. And we drove into that town. And the only thing we could afford, it was, it was after the, the, the Labor Day, and so the, the little summer cottages in this one area of Annapolis had been shut down, and, and I talked this guy into opening up that summer cottage so we could move in there. And the floors, there were holes in the floor that he had stretched carpet over. And I had $300 total for gas, food, everything. And he charged me us 50 bucks a week. And literally, I still love him today. You just, please don't groan because that's offensive to me over this. When literally three, two or three meals a day, all we could afford was a loaf of bread and bananas because they were very cheap and inexpensive mayonnaise, and I ate banana sandwiches, literally, three meals a day. And iced tea was cheap because it just took a few little bit of tea bags and, and water came out of the tap. And we drank iced tea and ate banana sandwiches, two meals at, or three meals a day for almost a month before I could finally get any kind of employment. <laughs> well, that's terrible. Terrible? Oh, God. Those are some of the most wonderful times of my life. Why? Because we were able to demonstrate to ourselves and God how fully we believed his call. Deserts, deserts, deserts. Oh, Jesus, help me. I did not. In okay. You quit resisting and resenting your sufferings if you're Christ's. If you belong to Christ, you quit resisting and resenting your sufferings and realize they're not punishment. They're all part of promotion. They're all part of advancement. So now, Luke 4, 16. And he came, he came out of the de desert in the power of the Spirit, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place. He fa they gave him Isaiah, but he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, 
to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day. He did an awesome thing when you wait and wait and wait, and you get to the day. <sighs> the day. We stop talking about what's going to come, and we get to the day. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. This day. This day. This day. This day. This day. This day. Now I've got a question for you. Why did he quit reading in the middle of what we consider verse 2, understanding that the Old Testament he was reading from didn't have chapters and verses in them? Why did he quit reading there? Because he couldn't say, if he'd have read verses 1, 2, and 3, he couldn't have said this day. Because the thing that came after the acceptable year of the Lord is the day of vengeance of our God. That's not wrath to come, that's wrath against sin. It's called the cross. It wasn't time for the cross. Because what happens after the cross? To comfort all who mourn. He couldn't say this day. Because the comforter had not come. And the comforter could not come until after the day of vengeance against sin, which was the cross. <laughs> hey. <laughs> if the first part had a this day... Then the rest of verse 2 and verse 3 had, had a this day. And what was this day for the verse 3? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Because he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. This is me. I, I, I'm not saying this saith the Lord. This is me, but this is my faith. Verses 18, 19, or in this case, <laughs> Isaiah 61, 1, 2, and 3 is the ministry of Jesus Christ to this world. My favorite, absolute favorite subject to teach on is doctrine. Oh, doctrine is where I got my first revelation. I thought you were raised in the church. If you were raised in the church and doctrine is not a revelation to you, you won't, you won't stay together forever. You will find a way out. But by myself, with no church to go to, not allowed to go to church, but there was no church to go to of our faith for four years. By myself with no pastor to call and no church to go to. And in the first six months of sitting around during study hour, supposedly studying, talking about God and talking to people that in my Pentecostal ego, I thought I was pretty knowledgeable in the book. Oh, because I'd gone to church all my life and listened to Sunday school teachers all my life. But in six months, I met people that knew the Bible a whole lot better than me. And by the time they were done with me, I didn't know what truth was or wasn't. Because all I was doing was parroting. Not parenting. P-A-R-R-O-T-T-I-N-G, -I, I think. <laughs> Forgive the second T if it's not supposed to be there. I was just repeating. That's, I can spell that one. <laughs> I was just repeating... What my Sunday school teachers had taught, what my pastors had taught. That I was so egotistical, I, sure, I was sure that I knew. And I had no answers for them. And so, in February of my first year, my mother gave me for my birthday my very first study Bible. It was called the Mark 
reference system Bible. It had all those printed colors in there, different subjects. You ever seen it? And it had a had this little center column deal you could refer to, and there was a concordance in the back that was about that thick. The full concordance was about that thick. And and there were some other references and whatever. And I got down by my bed. Because you see, the one thing I couldn't deny was my Holy Ghost experience. I knew that was real. I didn't know what else was true at that point, but I knew that was real. And I got down by my bed, and I, I don't even know where these words came from, honestly, before God. I, I, they were not forethought. I got down and by my bunk in desperation. My roommates were all out on liberty, and I didn't go do the stuff they did. And so I was by myself, and I got down by my bunk, laid that Bible down in, on, on that bunk in front of me, and, and, and I prayed something along this line, God, either you are a liar because you're a respecter of persons, or you've put me here because I prayed about this, and you opened the door, and you brought me here, and now I've got no pastor. i got no church. i got nobody to call. I don't know, have anybody to refer to. And either you're a liar because you're a respecter of persons or you're going to show me what the Bible teaches is true for myself. And God, I don't care who's right. I don't care what they call themselves. I don't care what brand they are. As long as they teach what you show me in the book. And, I, and this came out. And I, I promise you today, I will never go to the Bible to try to find support for my opinions. But I will always go to the Bible to let the Bible tell me what to believe. And at any point in time in my study ever, I, you show me stuff in the Bible I have not seen before. No matter how long I have preached or believed it, I will change to what you're showing me today. And there were other promises made. I spent two years supposedly studying engineering and applied engineering mathematics, and I got stacks of paper, lined eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that I used a pencil on. And I'd read, and I had all these different subjects on these sheets of paper, and I'd write out the verse longhand on whatever subject it fit in. And I did that and did that and did that till I felt like I had essentially every verse on any particular subject. Plan of salvation, water baptism, how to be baptized, what name to be baptized in. Is the Holy Ghost necessary for salvation? It, 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 how do you know you got the Holy Ghost? Et cetera, et cetera. How many gods there are? It just You name it, just stacks and all these different subjects. And I just, I just studied and prayed and, 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 and I'd write those scriptures out longhand. And I didn't try to come up with interpretation. But then I would study. Once I, once I felt like I pretty well wasn't finding any more verses on the subject, I began to pray about that, read those verses and pray about it. And I knew that truth con couldn't contradict truth. So therefore, as I read those verses, Revelation would bring every one of those verses into harmony. And any interpretation that verses contradicted wasn't from God. And then I would take it to the lab where you'd put it to the test. It was those same discussions. And it took about two years. But finally, they couldn't argue with any of it. I can't tell you, to tell you honestly, I was a little bit disappointed when I found the church that I was raised in was the one with the truth. Because I was all prepared to pay this big price of changing the truth. But I will tell you this today. I am not in the United Pentecostal Church because I believe what you believe. I'm in the United Pentecostal Church today because you come the closest to what God showed me for myself. What he showed me for myself. And I didn't plan on... I didn't plan on any of that because that's really off the subject. Listen to this. Luke 4, 18 and 19. I don't really know if you have the Amplified, sister, but I want to read the Amplified. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, 
to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, and here's amplified, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity, to proclaim the acceptable and ex accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, parentheses or brackets, the day when salvation and the free favors of God profusely abound. That part, he said, was fulfilled that day. Uh -uh. I wish we believed the Bible, but he read that part. He said, this day, this is fulfilled. Uh -uh. He read that part. He said, this day, that part is fulfilled. Oh, but people don't want what we've got. And it's hard to do this, and it's hard to reach anybody and because nobody wants this. That's a lie. That's a lie. Either Jesus lied, and we, we heard it last night, it's impossible for God to lie. And he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And let me tell you something. I mean, it's an attitude. I had an opportunity gift me after I'd... I, I only got about 20, I averaged about 20 hours a weekend that first year digging ditches, and it was cold in Maryland working outside. And so I had an opportunity to sell cookware. I made one really good sale to my mother. Needless to say, I didn't enjoy that very good. I felt guilty trying to convince these young couples getting married that they needed to, in, in 1971, that they needed to spend $700 on cookware. And china, and silverware, and glasses. And by the time you got through, you could easily spend $2,000 on all that. And my conscience wouldn't let me do that. And I found out there's a difference. You got to believe in what you're selling. And you got to believe people need what you're selling. And you got to believe that you are, you are being a blessing to them by providing them the opportunity to get it. I couldn't sell cookware, but I didn't have any problems selling Jesus. Because I believe, believe they needed him. I believe they wanted him. And I believe I was providing them a service by telling them how to find him. Some of us say, you really want Jesus, don't you? And others of us, our attitude and spirit says, you don't really want Jesus, do you? Praise God. Luke 4, 18 and 19 again from Weist's. Uh, if you haven't heard of that one, it's Weist's expanded translation. Uh, the Lord's Spirit is upon me because he anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me on a mission to proclaim release to those held captive and recovery of sight to those who are blind, to send away in release those who are broken, by calamity, to herald forth the epical period of time which the Lord has chosen and in which he takes pleasure. And concerning that, he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Put uh, please for me 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 on the screen. We're almost there. John, first, first John 3 and 8. Sorry. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, everybody say purpose. purpose. For this purpose, say this purpose. this purpose. The Son of God was manifested. Here's the purpose, you ready? 
King, this is King James again. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, I don't mean to be offensive here, but if that's the purpose he was <laughs> manifested for, he's not doing too good at it. If I'm going to take that verse and I'm going to read that verse for what it says, I don't see much of that happening. Destroying the works of the devil? No. But how about this? Would it surprise you to know that the Greek word translated destroy here, oh, and by the way, I found this in Strong's Concordance and Dictionary. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, <laughs> that... Would it surprise you to know the word destroy there is the same exact word that's translated loose in Matthew 16, 19. And unto thee I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And, forgive me, I'll do this really quickly if I can. The, 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 from collecting from a couple of different sources, the, 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 and I can't pronounce, I'm not a Greek scholar, it's L-U-O, it sounds like Luo to me, I don't know, or, or misspell Lou. Um, it, it basically means to loose, release, unbind, dissolve, sever, break, demolish. It means to loose one bound, to unbind, to release from bonds, to set free. Jesus was manifested to set people free from the things the devil has been able to accomplish in their lives. Well, that's sin. No, no, no. Sin is the problem. It's not the effect. So I'm going to say this to you again. The first ministry is to get them, help them get forgiven of their sins, cleansed, and filled with the Holy Ghost. What repentance, water baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost. That's the first step of ministry. But the next step, in which Jesus said was his ministry to this world, and that it was fulfilled beginning that day, was to help re set them free, release them, sever them from the effects. Of, of Satan's work in their life. To loosen, undo, dissolve anything bound, tied, or compacted together. To set them free. Jesus, now again, do you, do you believe the Bible? Jesus was manifested. To set people free. To cause them to be released from the effects of the things that sin and the devil has done in their lives. And I'm going to say it to you again. There's not one of us sitting here who's honest that would say that even some of our best people are truly able to claim, fully claim, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the promise. It's, it, what, it did not happen on the day of Pentecost. It did not happen on your day of Pentecost. That's the promise. That's what we have right to have expectancy for. That's what we're working toward in people's lives. <laughs> I, well, I'll be a little more honest than that. That's what I'm still believing for in mine. Because every once in a while, stuff I thought was old and dead, it's not as dead as I thought it was. No wonder Paul said he died daily. Because you die out to that stuff today, that's fine. But if you said, well, yesterday's death's going to count okay. No, no, no. Because tomorrow you're going to have problem dying because you didn't die today. You only died yesterday. Because you let that old, old stuff that's dead have a chance to resurrect. It is slick. It's really slimy stuff. Boy, it'll find its way out of that grave you put it in. So you got to keep 
Every day, Paul died daily. If you walk after the flesh, you're going to die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's what he, the man of God told you today. Jesus, you're going to save me this day. Not, hey, Lord, I got this. Let me show you how good I can do today. I call you if there's an emergency. But I got it right now. Hey, things are going pretty good. I got this. I remember when I was younger thinking, boy, I, I can't wait to get older so I can be so spiritual. I don't have all these problems. I'm still waiting to get older so that I get spiritual enough. I don't have all these problems. I guess if I live long enough, I'll get to that day. <clears throat> you don't have to come to the funeral. It's okay. Okay. Now, a couple of points before I get started. Uh, you're laughing now. <laughs> Here's a revelation for you. It is not the circumstances of your life that is your problem. But how you allow your circumstances to affect you as a person is your problem. Your circumstances are never your problem. Your circumstances are never your problem. It's if you internal those, internalize those circumstances and then begin to interpret what they mean. God wants you to be saved more than you could ever want you to be saved. He doesn't make it hard for you to know when you're not doing right. He prefers to do it with this gentle, sweet, still, small voice. That if you're sensitive to it, just the gentlest nudge, and you know, you know I, no, I don't want to do that. But it's not hard to know when you're displeasing God. If you're sensitive to hit the voice of His Spirit rather than to your flesh and its allies. So the idea that it's a, that, that circumstances that God allows circumstances to tell me something about myself, by the time your circumstances can be accurately interpreted as God trying to talk to you, you've been refusing to listen to him for a long time. Because using circumstances is a last resort, not the first step. I know I'm old, but I believe in corporal punishment. But I don't believe you use corporal punishment as the first resort. I believe it's the last resort. Second point, the things that are about to happen in here, if you have to see them to know they've happened, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Why does the Lord heal the sick, raise the dead, cause the blind to see, deaf to hear, why does he do all that? He does that as a first step to faith. That's the lowest rung of his work. He only does stuff that you can see the outcome on to convince you what he can do. Because you can go to heaven blind, deaf, lame, with cancer. But he, he gives miracles like that to give you faith that when he deals with the stuff on the inside that makes you susceptible and more in danger of being lost, you can believe it happen without seeing it. 
So there are going to be people who are going to leave this place with major miracles in their lives. But we're not going to know it till the testimony comes down the road. And so the point is going to be, if you think I'm going to stand here and grade God and me by what I can see happen, I want to be real kind and say this, you're out of your tree. That was kind. Because I've learned this. I've learned that if it's just like Brother Chatwell was talking about teaching somebody how to pray with people who receive the Holy Ghost. This is the same thing. You pray with people enough with this stuff, and you can you sense when they're beginning to believe. You sense when they begin to release it, and you can feel it leave them. You have to see something. You can know it. And when you do that enough, after a while, you expect the testimony. Now, I'm going to say to every person in here, before we begin the ministry, I told you Brother Stone King prayed for me. That was on a, two, a Wednesday night. I'm sitting at my desk on Saturday morning, and I'm studying, praying, and I get a, my phone rings. I pick it up. This is Brother Stone King. Yes, sir. He said, I was praying for you this morning, and the Lord told me to call you. This was 1984. He said, I, I, last fall, I was preaching a revival for Brother Kilgore, and he said there was a, a man in that church who had been born in that church, and he was born deaf. And he was baptized, received the Holy Ghost, been in that church all of his life. And he said, in that revival, the man had his hearing completely restored. Doctor verified, completely restored. But the problem was, because he'd been around that church all of his life, people didn't treat him like a new person. So now, as a hearing person, he doesn't fit in with the only people that he really had a close relationship in that church, and that was the other deaf people. But the hearing people didn't understand the need to bring the man into their fellowship because his whole world changed. And Brother Stone King said to me, even though doctors verified his hearing was completely restored, within, I think it was six or eight weeks the man had willed himself deaf again because he couldn't live with the miracle. He said to me, and the Lord wanted me to tell you, you and I both know that God worked that miracle in you the other night. But it may be a while before the full manifestation of it happens. Well, man... <laughs> I thought now that I was free from all that stuff, man, look out world. Because if God and his grace had used me with all my damaged goods to do what had happened so far, what in the world is going to happen now that I didn't have all this baggage? Well, remember what the, what the, where the Lord was. Your life is one of extreme highs and lows, and I'm going to take away your low places. I heard what I wanted to hear about that. Well, guess what? The reason I'd go into a low place is I'd try really, really hard to be good and then I'd make one mistake, whatever it was. And I'd, I'd be so upset with myself, I'd beat myself up so bad, that would start me down that slide. And it's a slippery slope and there was no way to stop until I hit bottom. And then I had no confidence in myself at all. And like I said to you yesterday, I literally spent much time in those low places hating myself. And the Lord said, he's going to take away my low places. I heard he's going to take away all my problems. Well, guess what? Everything I'd ever struggled with in the previous 33 years, I thought somebody aimed a machine gun at me with that stuff. And I was just, I was just being bombarded with it. 
And I'm going, oh, God, what's going on here? And, and it's, every time I'd have a thought or do something or not do something I should do, whatever, I, I would, I, oh, Jesus, forgive me. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. And, and finally, it was about six months. And I said, Lord, I thought you healed me. And that was the first time he, re, he responded to it. He said, what did I tell you I was going to do? <laughs> and I heard Brother Stone King say it in my head again. Take away your low places. He said, have you gone to any of those low places in this last six months? You know why? Because the first time in 33 years, all those other times when I made a mistake, I had to beat myself up and punish me because getting forgiven was too easy and I didn't deserve to be forgiven easy so therefore I'd punish me and beat myself down and abuse myself mentally, emotionally and however spiritually until I finally was so desperate in all of my punishing of myself I would finally ask God to forgive me and that's how I'd start coming out of that again but for those six months I didn't even realize what I was doing every time I made a mistake immediately I would say, Jesus, forgive me. And I never went into, I, I wasn't just, I wasn't looking for a license to sin. I, I just realized I was allowing him to forgive me without me having to pay for the mistakes first. And when I tell you that the full revelation of what God did for me came six months after the time I was prayed for, even though it was in effect, and I didn't understand what it was that was in effect since that day. I'm not perfect. If you are, God bless you, I'm not. I was trying to get some place the other day at home, and I was in a merge lane, uh, two-lane deal, and, and, and I needed in the left lane because it was one way going through a red light I needed to get through. And so I legally, I wouldn't do anything or just abusing anybody. I did a, I came, was coming from this way, perpendicular traffic, and turned this way. And, uh, and, and I put up my blinker on and tried to move over. And this guy, he wasn't going to let me over. He squeezed me out. So we get up to the red light. There was a right turn lane, so I turned down, went down, did a U-turn, came back up. Well, just as I was coming back up, the red light stopped, and guess who was stopped right at the red light? So when my light changed, before I knew what I was doing, the button was pushed, the window came down, and as I turned right, I didn't even look at him. I just waved at him as I went by. Well, I hadn't gone 50 feet till I was having to repent. Oh, God. Now, you may not think that's wrong, but it was wrong. It was wrong. And it only felt good for half a second. It felt bad really quickly. Of course, the greatest sins that Christians commit aren't things they do. It's the things they're supposed to be doing they don't do. Because he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Now, this is going to go just as quick as you're willing for it to. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. I wish we believed what the biblical definition of anointing is. What we call anointed is really just the operation of a gifting. And you don't even have to be spiritual to operate a gift once it's given to you. You don't even have to trust God to operate a gifting. The gift's in calling God without repentance. That means he doesn't change his mind. So it doesn't matter how you're living. 
you can operate that gift. And when a man gets proficient at operating a gift, we want to lift him up as some great guy. But let me tell you something. True anointing has nothing to do with operating a gift. It's the level of authority that's behind what you're doing. Because in the Bible, anointing always had to do with appointing to an office and the impartation of authority. But of course, you can't have authority unless you're under authority. Well, I, 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 I got a UPCI card, and, uh, and, and I'm under authority. Honestly. So every time those in authority in the structure over you plans a calendar, you're at every event. If you're under authority, you, you'd be there because that's what people under authority do. But we feel the liberty, the autonomy to come and go as we please. Which only reveals that having a card and being a good standard with the United Pentecostal Church is not under authority. In fact, our manual, if you read it carefully, does not give leaders in the United Pentecostal Church apostolic authority over people. So you can be the most submitted UPCIer there is, and you have no authority. You only are under authority if there's somebody in your life that can tell you no and you have to listen. And you can't get authority unless you're under authority because nobody has authority. They only exercise delegated authority. Authority is never possessed. It's only ever used when it's received by delegation. So if you don't have anybody in your life that can tell you no, be offended with me all you want. That's your business. But you don't have authority. You can operate a gifting, and you can do it proficiently, but the results will tell the tale. Jesus said, uh, they said, Lord, 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 look at this fig tree. And he says, he said, uh, have faith in God. He said, if you say unto this sycamine tree, be thou uh, uprooted, Casting uh, seed, it'll obey you. If you have a faith as a grain of mustard seed, just a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this tree, be uprooted and moved. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding the cattle in the field? And the word feeding cattle in the Greek is one word. It is the verb form of pastor. And cattle there, of course, is not cows. It's sheep. It's shepherding. So if you've got a servant, servant of God, who is plowing, which is preparing the ground to receive seed so there can be a harvest, and tending the sheep, making sure they're taken care of, when he comes in from the field, you don't say, hey, I know you're tired, go take care of yourself, and when you get around to it, you can feed me. No, you've been out there all day doing the work of God, and he says, put me first, feed me first. And after I am taken care of, then you can take care of you. I, I, it, did somebody take that out of your Bible? The way some of you are looking at me, you, you don't believe it's in the Bible. Because if I want cancers to listen to me, I've got to listen to God to the same level that I want cancers to listen to me. If I want lame legs to listen to me, I've got to listen to God to the same degree that I want those lame legs to listen to me. If I want broken hearts to be wounded when I speak to them, I've got to respond the same way when God speaks to me. It's a simple principle. It wasn't Jesus, it, excuse me, it wasn't anointing that made Jesus different. It was his authority. They wanted to know where he got that authority. So 
So if you can do that, just keep this one on screen for me because I, uh, I'm going to keep referring to it. And I want, to, I want it up there for them to see. Luke 4.18. Or, or is it 16? 14. Thank you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, hear me. Because I've been given the word, the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5. And I have been given the rhema, the word of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5. And because I have been appointed to be an ambas the ambassador of Christ and have been charged to, to, to plead or plead with them in Christ's stead or in Christ's place, be reconciled to God. Because that is the office to which every child of God and minister of God is called. I can then put this in the first person because he is in me. This is his ministry. If he is in me, his ministry didn't stop being his ministry because he is in me. In fact, that was the idea of him coming in me so that who he is and what he is will still operate through me. He will be himself through me. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. He has appointed me to an office and given me authority to announce, proclaim the good news to the poor. Now that semicolon, because it was not the original language, as the translators put it there. It should have been a colon. Because everything that follows that point is an explanation of what it means to, to announce or proclaim the good news to the poor. A poor person is someone that's distressed and destitute of spirit. It is someone who feels utter helplessness or complete destitution. It is very difficult to reach a person with a gospel who's on top of the world. Essentially impossible. But if you will pray and wait on God, the Lord will bring every lost soul to a place of destitution. He will bring them to the end of themselves and they will be ready to hear the gospel. And it is our job to be sensitive to where they are. And you don't pick green fruit. Every farmer, every orchard tender can look at the fruit and know when it's ripe. So in your sensitivity, you read the fruit and you know what day is harvest and you go harvest that day. And what day is harvest when it's ripe and what causes it to be ripe? It's reached a place where it can't help itself anymore. He hath sent me. He hath sent me. Look how personal that is. He hath sent me. The word sent, send there is the verb form of apostle. I can't pronounce it again, but it's apostello. That means to set apart, to send out, compelled to go out with urgency, to send forth on a mission. And it covers all of these instructions. You and I have been sent out to discern and to help those that are hurting. I love the word of God. I love the, 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 the anointing and the authority and the flow of ministering the word of God. But oh, God deliver us from the ego of needing to finish my sermon. Because God begins to move and people are broken up and they're responding and it's time to do something with them. But I'm not finished yet. So I doggedly and purposely press past the point of conviction to do it my way. Because they need to hear what I got to say. And by the time I'm ready to do something about it, all of that's lifted. Because we're sermonizers. God deliver us. I don't, I, I don't mean this against anybody. I don't have any meeting in mind. 
but I wouldn't walk across the street to attend a conference that's just a bunch of sermonizing. I don't care if it is UPC. I got better things to do with my time. Take that any way you want to take it. It's the truth. I want to hear from God. I don't want to hear a sermon. I want to hear from God. I don't have time for sermons. I want to hear from God. I want to hear from God. I want to know what thus saith the Lord. And do you know how insulting it is for a man to stand up there and preach something because he thinks you're going to be impressed with it and insinuate that he thinks that you don't have the spiritual sensitivity to know the difference? And if you don't have the spiritual sensitivity to know the difference, God help you. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. This is probably the most common problem of all of them. There's just three main areas of focus, and the prayer doesn't have to be long for each one of them. But I'm going to talk about them. We're going to pray for them. We'll talk about them. Pray for them. Because it is the will of God for you to go home healed. It is the will of God for you to go home healed. What is this? The word broken here means to crush completely, to shatter, to break in pieces, trodden down, trampled down, walked on. It comes from two root words. The first one means process, and the second is a rut or worn track. The brokenhearted are those who've just been treated the same way over and over and over again until you can't define which event was the one that finally broke your heart, crushed you. You can't define that because it was like a feather doesn't weigh much, but you can pile enough feathers up and those collective feathers Will, dist- will crush you. You're stupid. Can't you do anything right? What's wrong with you, boy? What's your problem? Can't you do anything right? And so, as I get older, I talk to myself like that. I make any kind of mistake. What's wrong? You're stupid. Stupid. You can't do anything right. You're stupid. Idiot. Why can't you ever do it right, idiot? Nobody here has ever talked to themselves like that in the last 30 minutes, have you? Yeah. But there's some people here that are crushed under the weight of that. And you hear that voice in your head. And you feel the effects of that. And it's on you. And in Jesus' name, as Isaiah 61 says, we're going to bind up that broken heart today. Now here... Hear the difference on this one. This is a little different than the next ones. The binding up of the broken heart doesn't mean you're instantly healed today. You bind up a wound so that it will heal. I've tried to be sensitive to this. And uh, because this is so personal, I'm I'm not going to have you stand. I'm not going to have you come down front. If you're hungry and you you recognize this is a word from God and you believe the Lord wants to do this for you, we're going to do this right where you are. Okay? In the name of Jesus. By the authority of the name of Jesus, I bind every bit of pain and every lie of shame that's working in the hearts and minds of those with broken hearts in this place right now. In the name of Jesus, I bind up the wounds of this heart. I bind the pain. In Jesus' name, I bind the broken heart up. The cords of the love of God, I loose upon you the cords of the love of God to wrap tenderly and gently around that crushed heart. 
holding the pieces of it back together so that it can be completely healed. In the name of Jesus, I loose the spirit of grace and peace from the Father upon you to be able to receive this right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now, whatever, whatever way you need to do it, you need to say, Lord, I give the wounds of my heart to you. In your own words, I release the wounds of my heart to you, Lord, and I receive from you, Jesus, your love and grace to bind up this heart, and I believe you're going to make it completely whole. Come on, receive that. In your words, that confession is necessary. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Come on, we're going to stay right here a minute. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It grieves the Father every time you speak negatively about yourself because of some mistake you've made. It grieves the Father. You're His son. You're his child. He birthed you. He died for you. He loves you. It grieves him. He wants you to let him love you. And his love binds up the wounds so that you can be healed. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Come on. The love and the compassion of God is working in this place right now. Receive it. Receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it in Jesus' name. He got to higher than I buy you. The Lord wants you to be whole. Because if you receive wholeness, you'll minister wholeness. Come on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, reach out for it right now. Receive it right now. We're going to go just a little bit farther. Come on, just a little bit farther. Let him do it for you right now. Hallelujah. It's not something we're looking for to see. We're just receiving it. We're believing it, receiving it. In the name of Jesus, it is not your will for your, his will for your heart to be broken and stay broken. It is not his will for you to be constantly suffering the inner pain of what's going on in your life. It is his will. It is God's will. It is the Father's will for you to be whole. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. We get so used to, to looking for somebody to go nuts in the spirit before we believe something's happening, we're, we, we miss it. Come on, there's folks receiving this right now. One more, one more moment. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, if you believe that the Father has talked to you, promised you and that his love is working in your life right now to bind up this wound I want you to just raise your hands and begin to thank him for it we're not asking anymore now we're thanking him for it come on thank him because thanksgiving is receiving because it's you give thanks when you believe you have received and it's not a question of feelings it's a question of receiving and believing in the name of Jesus in the name of come on give him thanks I, it doesn't have to be loud. I'm not looking necessarily for loud. I'm looking for deep. I'm looking for deep thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. He healeth, healeth the wounded in heart. That's the word of God. That's the promise of God. He healeth the wounded in heart. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Praise God. You can continue to pray, but I need to go on. Notice the next word, to preach. This is not the Greek word that's used to translate the words, or it's translated with the words, preach the gospel. There's one Greek word that's translated, preach the gospel. Those aren't three different words of the Greek. There's one word, Preach the gospel. This is a different word. It means different. The word preach is to herald, to proclaim, 
always with a suggestion of formality, gravity, and an authority which must be listened to and obeyed. It's not asking, it's telling. It's not, would you come out of this captivity? It's in Jesus' name, you are free from this captivity, come out. Okay, let's find out what the captivity is first. I am acknowledging the fact that it is possible, even though captivity, deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight of the blind is connected, notice, to preach, deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. I'm acknowledging they can, in some situations, be two different things. But this is what I feel led to do today. Because the, the one thing I want to talk about, we're going to minister to right now, is the thing that can both put you into captivity and cause you to lose your spiritual eyesight. It's the worst sin you can commit. It's the only sin that can cause the blood of Jesus to be removed from your past sin. And I don't have time to prove that, but I can prove that statement. It's the only sin. And it's the sin of unforgiveness. It's a sin of unforgiveness. He said, I don't have any grudges. Okay, all right. Are there situations in your life, you may not tell anybody this, but in your heart of hearts, you blame God for it happening like that? Are there situations in your life that you blame another person for it being like that? Are there situations in your life that you blame yourself? Every living blame, that's a weird way to put it. What's a living blame? I've never even said it like that before. That's just how it came out. What's a living blame? Whenever I think about a situation, my immediate next thought is, who's responsible? God let my child die. God let my mom or dad die when I was a kid. God let my parents die. Divorce. God did. We blame God. He say, well, you can't blame God. Well, somebody needs to tell Paul that, Acts 24, 16. Herein do I exercise myself always to have a conscience void of offense toward God. And man, if you can't blame God and have an offense toward God, then Paul didn't know what he was talking about because he gave great effort, first and foremost, to not let the circumstances that God led him into cause him to be offended at God for doing it. Or if there's things in your life that whenever the thought of that situation comes up or whenever that thing affects you, you immediately remember the person that you blame for either doing, what, doing something that caused that or something they didn't do that resulted in that. That's blame. You blame. Or, or when I was molested, I didn't have anything to do with that. But there are things I've done in my life that I hold myself completely responsible for. And I blame me with that. And I use that blame as a weapon to beat myself up with it and punish it. And I did that for 33 years. It may sound strange to have a grudge against yourself. But if blaming others is a grudge and blaming God is really a grudge, then blaming yourself is a grudge. And here's the consequence of grudges. The consequence is it will bring you into captivity. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 2 says that we're supposed to forgive lest Satan have an advantage over us. When you have a grudge, you give Satan leverage against you. You give him an advantage to use against you. That brings you into captivity. 
And the second part of that is blindness. Now, notice, this isn't talking about the people that are lost. If the God of this, uh, you know, if our gospel's hid, it hid in them lost, in whom the God of this world is blind and minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ should shine to them. And that's not who this is talking about. This is the recovering of sight. This is people who saw but don't see anymore. What caused that? The words recovering of sight comes from one Greek word. It means to see again, to discern with the eye again, to see with the mind's eye again. So what is it that causes a person to become spiritually blind? They lose their spiritual sensitivity, and they're now open to the deception of false doctrine. You hear me? This is being recorded, and this is being streamed. I said it. Mark it down. I said it. All those guys out there that want to be upset with me, all they have to do is prove it's not right. And they need to understand something when they try to do that. I know how to hear from God. And if they press me with that, he'll just tell me what it is they're hiding. Bring it on. But every person that has had the truth, that leaves the truth, they don't leave the truth because of a revelation, a new revelation. They get a new revelation because they've got offenses they're not dealing with, and they become blind, and that opens them up to deception. And it is deception. And you know what? When a person goes so far, you're wasting your time to debate Scripture with them because they're blind. They can't see. Well, this came from God. It sure did because you lost your love of the truth and he sent you strong delusion so that you would believe a lie and you're damned. So, here we are. We're going to pray. God wants you to be free. He doesn't want you to be a captive. And God wants you to see clearly again with your spirit, with your mind. Is it really worth the price of being bound a captive and of being blind to hold on your blame, your grudges? Is it really worth the price? No, it's not. So I'm asking you to begin to pray right now. I cannot speak the word of command to be free from captivity and speak the word of command that your sight would be, spiritual sight would be restored until you forgive whoever you're blaming for whatever you're blaming them for. God or others, or yourself. Brother Wright, I can't let it go. Then what you're really confessing is, I'm willing to stay a captive, and I'm willing to stay blind. It's worth it to me to be captive and to be blind so that I can hold on to my blame. Come on. Holy Ghost is here to empower you to do that right now. By the name of Jesus, I loose the spirit of grace upon every person in this room to be empowered to release that blame, to let go of those grudges. That's what forgiveness is. It's releasing. It's letting them go. It's letting them go into God's hands and letting him deal with it, and you stop trying to deal with it. In Jesus' name, come on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, by the grace of God, release that, th that, those grudges. In the name of Jesus, by the grace of God, release those grudges. In the name of Jesus, by the grace of God, release those grudges. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, we're getting close. 
It's almost time for the command. In the name of Jesus, come on. Come on, don't miss out. Don't miss out because you're holding on to this. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. In the name of Jesus, come on. Come on, let's let these things go right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. My, my, my. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You can lie to yourself, but it, this is, it's not true. You can't love the person you're blaming. You can say you do, but it's not true. Because love always produces forgiveness. Always. So when you start holding a grudge, you stop loving. I don't care who it is. Mom, dad, husband, wife, kids, pastor, whoever it may be. When you started holding the grudge, you stopped loving. And when you stopped loving, you started getting more and more critical. And all of your criticism justifies your grudge. All of your criticism justifies your grudge. The more, the more blind you get because of your grudge, the more ex excuses and justifications you're going to receive to justify holding on to your grudge. Come on, child of God. Come on, man and woman of God. It's not the will of God for you to live like that. You can't reach a town, a city. You can't minister to the church, to a, the church or to a lot to lost people holding on to grudges. You can't be whole and hold on to grudges. You can't be whole and hold on to grudges. You can't. And if you can't be whole, you can't have peace. You're sacrificing peace because peace is the absence of conflict. And that's exactly what a grudge is. It's holding on to the conflict between you and God, between you and others, or the conflict you have with yourself, between what you thought you think you ought to be and what you really are by your actions. Come on, just one more moment. I don't want to, I, the, I don't, the Lord doesn't want to leave anybody out. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. It is the will of God for you to go home free, not a captive. It's the will of God for you to go home seeing like you've never been able to see before, not blind. It's the will of God for you to go home whole with peace. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. All right. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the authority of the name of Jesus. I declare, proclaim, and command that you come out of that prison. That you be set free in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be free. By the authority of the name of Jesus. I command your sight to be restored. I bind the blindness caused by these grudges in the name of Jesus. And command your eyes to be open and see in the name of Jesus. I command you to see in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Come on, receive it right now. Thank God for it. Receive it right now. Thank God for it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm trying to hurry and yet do the will of God. Here comes one of the most tragic ones. He said, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The word bruised means to crush, to shatter, as by a sharp, sudden blow, broken by calamity. Notice there's a completely different effect when your heart is broken or crushed under the progressive weight of adding little thing upon little thing upon little thing until finally you're crushed. This is not that. This is a sudden, unexpected calamity in your life. This doesn't talk about getting healed. Notice, this is talking about getting delivered because sudden calamitous events 
bring a bondage of grief and heaviness. It throws your whole world off axis. And some people never recover. It may be walking into the house one day and mom and dad suddenly announcing, we're divorcing. It may be an automobile accident happened to a loved one. It may be an accident happened to you and you lost limbs or function or whatever. It, it can be, it, even though it sounds like it's not sudden, it's thinking you're healthy and then getting a, an unexpected diagnosis that you could potentially die from whatever the diagnosis is. It, it, it can be any kind of calamity. And that's not, it's not just a, an emotional thing. It, that calamitous event says, the adversary says through that event, God is not in control in your life. And the moment you begin to believe he's not in control of your life, you come into a bondage of fear. People who have experienced calamitous events battle fear and fear hath torment and there's people in this room right now not only you but you've got loved ones that are battling fear right now you're in bondage to that and it all traces back to that calamitous event the death of a loved one the death of a pastor you were submitted to that pastor. You were getting authority from that pastor. And now your pastor dies. And you are now pastorless. And that means you no longer have anybody to submit to. So you went from exercising with a delegated authority because of your submission with no one to submit to. And now there's a difference. And you know what it is? You've lost authority. It's a sudden, you didn't expect that. You didn't prepare for it. It wasn't time to prepare for it. And it has, a, it has potentially a disastrous effect in your life because it, war it just warps and skews your whole perception of yourself and where you're headed and what God's doing. And, and it just, it just makes, it, it makes it almost impossible to trust again like a child or to, or to wake up one day and find out that your mate's been committing adultery on you and you had no idea. That's a calamitous event. Your whole world's rocked. Nothing is ever the same again. But Jesus Christ has come to set you free from events that have bruised your life. Notice a bruise is not a cut, but a sharp blow that's delivered that causes the blood vessel under the skin to just all shatter. And it can be happened bad enough that the blood, which is called hematoma, can get the bleeding gets so bad you it could actually you could could potentially die from what started out from as a bruise, because a, an open wound you can see it's bleeding. You try to do something to stop the bleeding, but a bruise that's bad enough, it doesn't bleed on the surface. It all bleeds under the surface. There's no open wound to see. That's what's so terrible about it. There's no open wound to see. I'm okay. I'm okay. It's okay. It's, I'm okay. I'm making progress. I'm okay. But you're not okay. Because your faith and trust is shaken. And that's opened the door for fear. And fear brings into bondage. And fear has torments. Right now. Before the word is spoken, the word of deliverance. Come on, we need to release these things to God. We need to release them to God. Father, this is, this is the prayer my wife and I prayed almost every day during her bout with cancer. Father, we know you love us. Father, even though we don't understand all of this, that's happening or happened, we know you're in control and you only want the best for us. And Father, we trust you.
We trust you with all that's happening. And whatever the outcome is, we believe you're in control. And we trust you, Father. When you can pray that, you close the door to fear. You close the door to fear. You close the door. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Release those things to God. Release them to God. Release them to God. Release them. I release it to you, Jesus. I can't fix this. Calamitous events are things that can't be undone. Their calamitous events are things that you don't have control over. You can't fix. You feel so helpless. You feel so hopeless. Your world is so disturbed. You feel like your world is out of control in that area at least. But you need to give it to God. I trust you, Father. I know you love me. I know you want the best for me. I know you're in control. And whatever has happened, I know you've got a plan. And you know the outcome of this. And I trust you, Father. I give it to you, Father. Come on. You need to say those words somehow, some way. In your own words, you need to say that. Come on. In the name of Jesus. 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 In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the authority of the name of Jesus. I command you to be loosed and set free from the effects of these these calamitous events in your life. In Jesus' name, be free from every effect, hidden and, and seen. In Jesus' name, be free. In Jesus' name, be free. I take dominion and authority over the spirit of fear and its torment that wants to paralyze these lives. I command you to loose them in the name of Jesus. I command that you be set free in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, let's receive that right now. Raise your hands and thank God for it. Receive it. Even if the work isn't completed today, this is a good start. And you know what to continue to do when you get home until it's all gone. Come on. Come on. At least you'll be understanding what has happened. In the name of Jesus. I know it's after one minute. One more thing. Just one more. One more, okay? Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I, 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 time is limiting and I have to rush through this. I'm asking you to get uh, access to this and to listen to it and pray. We're going to do one last thing. We're going to do the part that was reserved for the Holy Ghost and the church that Jesus couldn't confess started starting that day. It didn't start till the day of Pentecost. And that's the comfort for all who mourn. What is mourning? Mourning is the grief you feel over loss. Lost over things that you expected to be that aren't. And lost over things that, that happened that you never expected to happen. It's not, this isn't the same thing. This can be any kind of, any kind of loss. Any kind of loss. The grief of it. He promised to comfort all who mourn. And that third verse is beautiful in all of the different things he does to comfort those who mourn. And I don't have time to go into it right now. But, but I, I, would, I do want to pray the prayer of comfort. But before I can do that, you have to do what Paul did. But what, what, whatever former things, excuse me, but what things were gained to me, I, those I counted lost for Christ. A parent that's died, a mate that's died, a child that's died. Opportunities that you expected that went to somebody else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Dreams that you had that aren't going to come to pass. Everything that you expected, everything that was gained to you that now has no chance of happening is loss. And we carry grief over that unless we do something with it. 
and he promised to comfort all who mourned. And hear me, hear me. Brother Shetwell and Brother Franklin Howard saw to it that I was positioned to receive this revelation. In February of, of 03, in the snowstorm of the century in our area, half of our church building collapsed under the snow, including our auditorium. I designed that auditorium. I built it. I oversaw the building of it. I had memories of all places in there, spots I could take it to, stuff happened. And it wasn't but a pile of rubble. And to this day, the, our county is ridiculous. We haven't been able to build it back. I was grieving so bad. Brother Howard and Brother Shedwell were working with me in a meeting in uh, Rhode Island. And they got together and said to me, we're here with you for support, but we're not speaking. You're doing all the teaching. Well, I hadn't made up my mind. They were doing all the teaching. I wasn't speaking because I didn't feel like it. But they put me in a place knowing I would hear and repeat what God was saying, where I spent three nights and two days letting the Holy Ghost talk to me. And by the end of that last night, on my face, after everybody else was given the chance to pray, I got down, and I did exactly what I'm telling you to do. I took everything that was gained to me and all that, and I realized that if I compare what I lost with what I was gaining and would gain, which was Christ and a relationship with Christ that would be advanced by that, that I could honestly say, dung, just dung. Whatever you've lost that you're still living in the grief over, you cannot go forward. You cannot have hope or joy for the future while you still daily fellowship with a grief over your losses. You can't go forward. Let's pray right now. Jesus, some of you are going to have to do this when you get home because this is just too quick for you. You're going to have to work through this, but you're going to have to take the loss or the losses. And you're going to have to give them to Christ and say, here it is, Lord. Here it is. Having you is, worth, is, is the price that's worth the loss. Having you, having this relationship with you. Come on. He wants to comfort you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, receive it right now. Receive it. Receive it. The Hebrew in verse 3 talks, says that the Lord, the Lord doesn't force this part on you. He sets comfort before you. He makes comfort available to you, but you have to choose to release the loss, and you have to choose to take the comfort. That's, the, that's the, what the, the, Greek, the Hebrew literally says there. He places all that he's offering you that will bring comfort to you and great benefit to your life. He places it before you. He makes it available, but you have to choose to give up the loss so that you can take the gain. And all the stuff God's got for you is just far enough out of reach. It's not way down the road. It's just far enough out of reach that while you're holding on to the loss, you can't reach the future. As long as you're holding on to the loss of the past, you can't reach God's future for you. Come on, let it go. Just one more minute. Come on, just let it go. Let it go. Just let it go. When you've done it, Raise your hands and just thank him for it. God bless you. In the name of Jesus.